class, we are actually on a very, very long Torah portion. It is the longest Torah portion in the Chumash. Is your eyes okay? Are you okay? Yeah, I know my eyes is bothering me for you. Got it. Nerves. Oh, I see. So, yeah. oh. so, so we are in Pasha's Nosoi. Pasha's Nosoi is a very long Pasha. It's the first Pasha after the giving of the Torah. So you have it on page, it has 176 verses. 176 makes it the longest Pasha in the entire Chumash. But since we are coming off Shavuot and everybody is still excited about the, the Torah reading and accepting the Torah, so I guess it felt an appropriate time. If we'd be somewhere in the middle of the winter, in the middle of the summer, we might be a little more clutching about it. But since you are in the, in the end of the Shavuot holidays, everybody feels a little better about it. This is Pasha's Nasser. And the Pasha talks about a number of things. Obviously, like every parsha, it talks about the special positions and the jobs, continuing with the Levim, what they did. And then it talks about the purity of the Jewish camp. It talks about a very interesting discussion about a woman known as the Sota woman, which she wasn't clean and suspected by her husband that maybe she wasn't uh, faithful and a very esoterical process, obviously in, in physical um, means like water and, uh, and drinking of water, but the whole idea that the water and erasing some words in the water will make your stomach explode if she was wrong or made your stomach actually improve if she was right, if she was innocent, is not a, um, you know, it's not something that we can practice or explain physically. Then the Pasha continues with the Nazarite and his responsibilities. We talk about the priestly blessing with Kat Kohanim. And then, if this is what I want to start discussing tonight, hopefully with God's help, is chapter seven, which is on page 764. Now the Pasha is going back to what we read in Vayikra. As you remember, the Mishkan was built and the Mishkan was finally completed. And there was the famous offering that Moshe was training the Kohanim in the service of the Mishkan. And then it was the eighth day of that uh, training uh, program is when it was the passing of Aaron's two sons, not of an Abiu, we had an old Pasha for it, Pasha Shmini. And now the Torah in this week's Pasha is going to discuss what happened in the first almost two weeks since the Mishkan was dedicated. And simply what happened was that the leaders of the tribe called the Nesim, when we discuss them in a, mo in a moment, each one personally chose to bring a gift of offerings in honor of the new Mishkan, representing their particular tribe. There were 12 tribes, well of leaders. Surprisingly, they all brought an identical gift, the same. Surprisingly further is that the Torah, instead of just saying, and so after listing the gift at the first day to say, and that's what this tribe brought, and similarly that tribe brought, and let's keep on going the, the list of the names in one verse, maybe two verses mentioned. This is what this tribe and that tribe, but they all basically did the same. Instead, and that's what makes this parsha even longer, is the fact that the Torah repeats by each and every tribe, giving him his full name, his full title, 
And again, description of the full gift in all its details, which is literally not one inch less or more than what the other tribe gave. All tribes gave exactly the same thing. Okay? If you want to see it, this is actually going to start on page 76, verse 12. I'm going to read you one. It says, the one who brought his offering on the first day, his name was Nachshon, the son of Aminadav, of the tribe of Yehuda. What was his offering? So it talks about a silver bowl, and he brought a certain a spoonful of gold, and one bull, and one ram, and sheep, and one goat. A beautiful gift. Comes on verse 18, the second day, which is the tribe of Issachar, represented by their leader, Netanel ben Tzuar. Same story. They brought this, and they brought that, and they brought this, and exactly the same what Nachshon brought. And Zvulun's leader, exactly the same. And everybody is getting five or six verses with the same description, which the Medrash and all the commentators are trying to make sense of the, of the idea, which is seemingly uh, unusual, right? To have the same story repeat itself over and over again. It's a very famous medrash, which it's important to mention, it's good to know, is what the medrash says. It brought the same $100 bill, right? That each one brought it with a different type of enthusiasm. Each one had his own intention, his own kavana. What did he have in mind when he bring it? And when the Torah translates it into writings, I can't just write, and they brought this and this and that. But it's not about the ball of silver and the golden spoon. It's what was intended and directed in each of those korbanot, in each of those gifts. And all is what the Torah lists in, uh, in great detail as I mentioned. But I want to go back to the beginning of chapter seven. And this is what I would like to discuss. And this is the gift which preceded the gift. Basically, there were two gifts. There was a collective gift and there was an individual gift. The collective gift is what we read from verse one till verse um, 10. And then there is the individual gift, which we read from verse 10 all the way to the balance of the parish. The collective gift was an interesting gift. They were not asked to do it. Matter of fact, Moses didn't even originally accept the gift from them until God had gave the signal that it's okay to take it from them. And it was simply a gift to help the schlepping. We have the Levites, who we spoke about them in the last couple of weeks. The Levites are divided into three sons from the tribe of Levi. There is Gershon, there is Kehas, and then there is Merori. And the tribe of Merori, as we read last week's parsha, was in charge of carrying the skins, the curtains for the Mishkan. The tribe or the part of the Levites, which are the Kehosites, they were in charge of carrying the utensils, the ark, the utensils, meaning the ark itself and some other, they had to carry it on their shoulders. And then there was the Gershonites, they were given the big job and they had to schlep the poles, the beams. So it's very heavy, long beams, wide and long and heavy made out of special wood, chicken wood, and they had to schlep it anytime they traveled. 
they had to carry it with a very hefty load. The Nesim came and they said, we have an idea. Let's initiate a gift, surprise God with a gift. Surprise Moses, surprise the Levites. What is it? Wagons. <laughs> so simple, but so clever. Wagons. Let them carry the wagons. Let them carry the, 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 the beams and the curtains on wagons. We can't do anything about Kehos. They have to, they were specifically told they have a mitzvah and obligation to carry it at their shoulder. But that's the Kehos Nick. Your side. But other than that, let's do it. So let's first read a few verses inside. Verse 1 it says, Vayehi Bayoim Kalois Moshe Lokim is a Mishkon, Vayim Shahoisoi, Vayakadish Oisoi, Veskol Kalo, Vesamisber, Veskol Kalo, Vayim Shochem, Vayakadish Oisoi. It was on the day that Moses finished erecting the tabernacle, that he anointed it sanctified it and all its utensils and the altar and all its utensils and he had anointed and sanctified them. The leaders of Israel, the heads of their father's households brought by Yakrivu, hey Messiah Amatois, they brought offerings. They were the leaders of the tribes. They were those to stand at the countings. Very interesting that in English, you're lacking the beauty of the translation of the words. These people are called number one, Nesia Israel. What's a Nasi? President or leaders of Israel. Okay, I will take this translation. Roshe Beisa Voisom is translated the heads of their father's households. What is the head of their father's households? Each tribe has his household, which is the Uvenite, Shimonite, the Hudoite, and then there is the head. Okay. Then there's another name, Heim Nesie Yamatos. And they are the Nesim again, the leaders of the tribes. What's the difference between the leaders of Israel and the leaders of the tribe? We're talking both about, obviously, the leaders of Israel is by, is, is by default the leaders of the tribes. The verse uses two terms, Nesie Israel, the leaders of Israel, and Nesie Hamatois, the leaders of the tribes. They weren't the leaders of Israel. They, all, they were only leaders of Israel because they were, each one, a leader to its own tribe, right? Rashi, I guess, was bothered with this question. And Rashi says that the word Matois which means always tribes, also comes from the simple meaning and translation of the word mate, which is what? Staff, six. What does it mean, the leaders of the six? Says Rashi, those 12 individuals who were appointed to become the leaders of the tribe were those individuals who in Egypt were appointed as officers by the Egyptians being forced to be responsible that the Jews are keeping up their work to the task which was expected from them. What is that? Taskmasters. Taskmasters, it's called in English. And those taskmasters were meant to ensure that the Egyptians decree that we expect this amount of bricks, they were responsible to make sure that the Eden are working their back and they're working themselves out to ensure that by the end of the day, this is 
the amount which we will receive. But they did not push the Jews too much. They, it was enough what they had to do there, and they did not care to go and press them and, 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 and beat them, God forbid, so they should be able to finish up their task. So at the end of the day, when the Egyptians came to collect the amount of work, and they realized that the Jewish people did not do and did not accomplish what they were expected, they started beating those taskmasters. They were beaten, they are called Shoitre Bnei Soil, the officers. It was in Pasha Shmois. Rashi brings there in Chumish Moiz, Vayuku, chapter 5, it says, Vayuku Shoitre Bnei Israel, that the officers of Israel were bitten. And Rashi says that those were the Israelite officers, which they were very sensitive to their colleagues, and they did not press them to do their work, and they were bitten. Says Rashi, you know what the title Nesie Amatois means? the leaders of the matot, it doesn't just mean tribes. It means those leaders who became leaders through the staffs which were broken on their backs, the sticks which were hit, they were hit by the Egyptians. This is what made them the leaders of Jewish people. That's how they became leaders. They are self-sacrifice for others. As we see also later, 12 became head of the tribes. And that what Rashi brings later, in Pasha's Baloyz, or next week's Pasha, that 72 of them became the Sanhedrin members. So Rashi Dir also says, where are those, those people who came from? That was also another selection of those taskmasters who were letting themselves being beaten. So the pshat, the meaning of the word nesie amatot, literally means what? The leaders do to the staffs. That's the word. They became leaders, while the word nasi means they were anointed and they were elevated because there was a staff being broken over them. Because of the staff. Imagine just like the Kohanim, thinking you want to describe it, the Kohanim were anointed with the oil, anointing oil, mm -hmm. right? That's how they were anointed to serve as priests. How would the Nassim, the leaders, what was how would they anoint it? The staff. That was the patch, the clap they got. That was which anointed them. Now, the verse continues. What did they do? And they brought a gift. Verse 3. And they brought their offering before Hashem. What did they bring? Sheish Eglois Tzot. Six covered wagons. The word tzav, Rashi says, means a covered wagon. Some commentaries actually say that the word tzav in Hebrew means a turtle, because these wagons were schlepping themselves with all this wood that took them literally the effort and time of a turtle. They were working like turtles. That's why they were called the glot tzav. So they bought six wagons, six covered wagons, ushne also bokor. And they bought 12 oxen. Agolo al shnei anesim. Veshoel leechot. Interesting. Two leaders partnered with the one wagon. But each one brought one ox. So there was two oxes for, two oxen for each wagon. And they bought it before the Mishkan. Why did they bring the wagons? As we mentioned before, and we're going to see soon, the wagon was simply because, as 
the Orach Haim HaKadosh says, the Ramban says, that was heavy. They felt bad. That was heavy. You can come in any time you want. Don't worry about it. You can come in any time you want. They were basically, that was heavy. That was heavy, heavy stuff. Heavy beams, heavy wood. So when it's heavy, what do you do? You can say, oh, leave it, the beam. David Schneider, let him sleep. What do I care? He's a lady. That's his job. Comes a nasi, the same nasi which he allowed himself to be bitten in order to protect another Jew. That's the same Nassim. And they see the Levim are going to Nebuchadnezzar themselves with heavy, heavy beams. They said, no, no, no. We got to help them. We got to take care of them. Let's give them a wagon. Let's get them some wagon. And when they came to the Mishkan, as you're going to see that Hashem tells Moshe, take it. Verse 4 says, Hashem says to Moshe, Take it from them. And they shall be to perform the work. The service of the tent of meeting. You can give it to the Levites, each according to his work. And as Rashi says, that why did Hashem have to order for Moshe to take them? Because Moshe did not, did not originally feel that he should take it. God told me that the Levim have to carry it. I guess that's their job. I'm not taking even that which seemed rationally correct. Without getting orders, we don't do things. That's the way Moshe works. You don't do what it makes sense. You once heard from the Rebbe's secretary, one of the Rebbe's secretary, the Rebbe Binyamin Klein. He never spoke to anything in public. He was the secretary. The Rebbe's secretary, the first, the last, the middle, most important responsibility was to be silent. And I remember once when the son got married, but a little Fabrenga in the last day of Feb, I thought, and he said some story. I remember he said something, it always sticks in my mind. This is 1989 or 1990. He said, upstairs in 770, he said like this, guys, I'm driving the river in the car, he's driving up to the mikvah, come back. The Rebbe Rebbe home sometimes. He was a secretary. So, you know, sometimes the Rebbe starts talking to me. And maybe I'm thinking for a moment, okay, I, 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 I see where he's going. And I always, always end up being wrong. He always takes a complete different direction that I didn't even imagine that that's coming. You think after all the years, you had to figure out, never figure out. He says to the Rebbe, the first rule is don't estimate. That's because he said this, so probably he means that too. No. And he gave the following example. He told us, imagine guys, you are in a room and the floor is all messy and dirty. The rabbi walks in and he says, no, Mordechai, take a broom. He says, take a broom. Don't clean it. You don't know what he wants you to do with it. Not because the room is dirty and he asked you to take a broom, it means that he wants you to broom the, to clean the floor. I don't know what he's gonna do with the broom. <laughs> but that don't 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 imagine that the one plus one is gonna end up two. No, it can be five. That's how the rebel works. <laughs> so I'm saying here too, Maisha. What is, what, what's so difficult to take such a beautiful gift? You have a heart. You see the Levim. Nobody has to schlep. Here comes the C.A. Slow and the greatest of the great, nice Jewish leaders. They come and say, we want to give a gift. Why should I make the simple math? The Nasi wants to give a gift a wagon. The Levi never schlepping the wood. 
It's heavy. So let's make it happen. Moshe says, I'm waiting for God. And the deal of the verse emphasizes, Yoyim HaRashem and Moshe, Hashem tells to Moshe, Kach mi itam. Take it. He doesn't take it until he's being told to take it. Last and final verse, Vayikach Moshe Saagolais, verse 6. So Moshe took the wagons, this Arba Sabok, and he gave it to the Levites. And he divided it between the two Levites. Like we said before, the third one didn't get. What was the two Levites who got? Four of the wagon, I'm sorry, uh, two, of the, two of the wagon and four of the oxen he gave to the sons of Gershon in according with their work. What were the people of Gershon carrying? They were carrying the curtains. For them, for them, two wagons is enough. The other four, this Arba Golois, the Shmoina Sabokor, the other four wagons and the eight oxen, no salib name Merori. If you have a dosso, we have the Sobelana Coin, the Merori, they had a big task, they slept the beams. They obviously need more. So they are getting four. Four wagons to Merori, two wagons to Gershon. Well, about chaos. Says the final verse, let me chaos, loyna san. But the people of chaos did not give. Why? He avoid us a koide shaleyem, but kosef is so. Was the sacred service is upon them, and they are carrying it on their shoulders. Beautiful story, clear. Now comes the big question. Do you have any questions? Do you have I any would, questions? I would make a comment that the reason why they needed the wagons was that the Levites were not subject to the hard task in Egypt, so they weren't in the same physical condition as the rest of the tribe. What do you mean? Well, if you're working and everything, you're that you're at a, your your muscles and everything else is much more stronger than the the group that wasn't didn't do any of the uh, tasks in Egypt. So they were okay. subject, so that would be a, one of the other reasons why they felt sorry for the Levites, because they weren't physically... Uh, okay, listen, uh, since you are Levi, I'm going to accept it. Sure. Would Moshe have waited for Hashem to tell him that these were fine? Because he had made a mistake with the multitude without asking that. What do you mean? Well, he allowed the multitude to give them from Egypt, and he hadn't asked God that was okay. Okay, I'm. I mean, I'm looking for a question in, in the in the very um, issue, in the very discussion. The Rebbe has a very strong question, very very strong question. Rebbe says, I don't understand. He's bringing half a wagon. Why a half a wagon? Why are you being cheap suddenly? <laughs> suddenly they're being cheap. A half a wagon. You have to remember. What encouraged originally the Nisim, the leaders, to bring gifts? You remember what happened in Pasha's Kapudeh. They stay originally, we're kind of waiting to see how <laughs> things are going to develop, right? But equally trauma, everybody's bringing their gifts. And they said, okay, everybody's gonna bring, and we're gonna join them. I'm sure there's gonna be enough to bring. What happens in the end? Everybody brought, and then they see my get breaking up from their in their relaxed attitude, and they realize suddenly there's nothing left. The Jewish people had bring everything. There is no more wood needed. There is no more gold needed. There is no more silver needed. They're freaking out. What do you mean? They're not going to have any part of the Mishkan. They're not going to be any part of it. We wanted to be a part of it, but I'm sorry. 
when we made our collection and when we asked for the money, you simply weren't there. We didn't give. Everybody else gave. And thank God, it was an overwhelming kind of experience, right? Everybody brought and brought and they had to make an announcement. Please, no more, no more. Imagine. Cheder, yeshivas, Chabad says, have dinners. And the, and the principal of school gets up, the rabbi gets up. Guys, thank you all for coming tonight. Appreciate and supporting our school. But one thing, please. No more money. The bank is packed. The account is loaded. We ask you no more money. You want to help us? Otherwise, you want to come help the kid? You can't. Money is it's just been running too much. That's great. I don't think that miracle ever repeated itself. Right? I don't think this miracle ever repeated itself. But in Pasha's Vayake, you learn that this is the miracle what happened when the Mishka was built, right? What does the verse say? The, the women were helping with waving the, the wool. What does the verse say in Vayake? It says, Vanesi me view. And the leaders of the tribe, what did they bring? They brought Avni Shoyam. They brought beautiful diamonds. Avni Amiluim, Loefoid, Velachoshet. They brought for the Mishkan, for the for the Chayshen, for the breastplate. They gave the jabs. And as Rashi did bring from the Medrash, Rabbi Natan said that when it came to the Mishkan, that's exactly what I just told you. The Nesim said, let the community bring. And whatever is going to be missing, we're going to complement. Complete. And when they realized that everything was brought, like the verse says, so that's why they went and they decided, okay, if there is no more anything for us to bring, let's go bring that which is going to serve for the breast. That's exactly what happened. So it's Rashi that that's what happened by the Mishkan. They were lost. They were last by the Mishkan. When it came to the dedication of the Mizbeach, which is our Parsha, they were first. They brought the first Kabbalah. So the Rebbe says, one second. If this old gift was a response to lacking the enthusiasm and the initiation of gifts, when the Mishkan was built. So now you're coming to be the, 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 the better person, the Balchuva, right? I'm going now to be first. I'm not waiting for anybody. So you come up with a half a wagon. I am mensch. You want to be? Be a mensch. Give a wagon. What would be wrong to have 12 wagons? It would be great. Isn't the term as more is merrier? More the, the more the merrier. And as you know, and especially if you look at the Gemara, the Gemara in Shabbos talks about the wagons actually. And the Gemara calculates that the wagons were literally packed to the max. So the Gemara works out that there was every beam was needed also in sockets. So the 48 beams, each one is five meters long, a half a meter wide, another additional 60 beams, the sockets for the beams. The tutzach, each socket weighs a full kikar shekel, right? The all heavy, heavy stuff. And the Gemara even says that they were organized such a perfect way, knowing the desert sometimes there's a little, the wagons are taking a little uh, ups and downs, and the beam starts to to shift, to wiggle. And there was actually Levi's who would keep on running around the, the wagons and keep on making sure that the beams are remaining organized in their structure, in their schedule. 
Then the question is begging, why can't they just give a few more wagons and make it easier for us? Especially, I'm saying, when we learn about the Beis Amikdash, we learn about Korbanot, we all know how much the concept complete is always mentioned, right? Tamim iya, right? Tamim, always to be perfect. Echo bank in other blemish, right? Like the Rashi said, it says, Adam ki akriv, Adam in the singular, to tell you that just like a person, you know, is single, so too every carbon has to be single ended. You have to be a, bring, a, a carbon. And yeah, the, the Torah is using special verses that it's okay for two people to join in a carbon. In other words, you need like a special verse to teach it to you. In the special verse, to teach you that you can also bring two, especially they all brought a, a, a full ox, right? They didn't partner in the auction. So suddenly it comes to the wagons, everyone's becoming so, uh, you know, so I wouldn't say cheap, but something is, something is, something is not heading up with the wagons. That's the question. The Rebbe goes into a beautiful discussion which is interesting, an interesting discussion which we find in Allah. There is two contradictory terms that we actually find in regard to the Mishkan. There is a term that is in Talmud being used many times. It says, Ein aniyut bimkom ashirut. We don't act poor in a place of wealth. For example, the Mishnah says that every korban, the sheep, every day you have to offer a sheep for a korban in order to make it easier for the shochet to remove the skin of the sheep. They actually used to water the sheep, meaning they used to give the sheep a big cup of water and the drinking of water will apparently help assist with the, what's it called, with the removing of the skin, of the wool. Sure. No, not sure. Skinning. Removing yeah. skinning. skinning. Skinning, the water would help. You know what the Mishnah says? That they used to give him a nice cup of water in a golden cup. Golden cup. Says the Gemara. Water, what is it? What the Casco got by a, a bunch of cups, you know, recycle it every day, throw it in the garbage next. <laughs> Golden cup. Says the Gemara, mm -hmm. you know why? Ain a news be mocking a ship. This is a. No, no. That answer I will, I will accept. That's not the answer. The answer is we are in a place of wealth. We are not be going to be acting here for cheap. We are not going to be cheap. Even the sheep is going to get a golden cap. Okay? Ain't a new remokim sheep. That's one expression. But the same Gemara in other cases, which we are seemingly acting cheap, the Gemara says that the reason why we are cheap seemingly because we don't like to waste people Jewish money. Here, let me give you three examples. I don't want to go into a lot of it. This is called Talmudic Encyclopedia, okay? So instead of opening a bunch of Gemaras, sometimes you have over here the, you have over here the, the, the quick and, and summary Yeah, the one with the sheep. I'm just going to give one example of each, but I don't want to. I want to come to the to the answer. I don't want to do the sit here and um, here. Ain't a new remokim ashirus. We don't do things cheaply if we in a place of wealth. What's the one of the examples? That um, yeah, the sheep. 
Another example, when the garments of the Quran become dirty, there is no laundry in the base of Mikdash. It became dirty, let's buy new ones. Let's make new ones. Why? They are rich. They have all the money. This is Hashem's home. What was money created for if not for God? But let's use it. Anything we can use from gold, that is a special commandment to make of silver, we use gold. In the other end, there is other things. The shofar wanted to be plated with gold. Almost says no. Why not? Because why should you waste money? Shofar is a nice shofar. Why should you waste his money? Yeah. Let's Just give me one second. Yeah, anyway, there's things that we don't do. And the question goes, the commentary are trying to discuss which ones, I mean, can somebody take you home? Because I'm not going home. Who is you who can take you home? Ask the teacher of you, Yaakov or somebody. Okay? A Torah chaser, the Torah is careful on Jewish money. When do we say this? When do we say that? The Rebbe said something very interesting. He says there's one thing considering the quality of what things are made of. You can make it out of gold, you make it out of gold. We are not cheap. Anything you can do on a good quality, on a better quality, you make it the best quality possible. Then there is wasting. Wasting is unacceptable. Quality, we're going to use the greatest, but to waste something which is empty not use for any purpose is not accepted in the base of it. Just a second. Let me forgive me a second. Hello. Yeah, that's fine. Well, he wasn't going to take this because he learned his lesson. No, he hadn't learned it yet. It gets painful all the way through. So, um, so the difference between waste, <laughs> to the end of a second, waste and using best quality is two separate concepts. Two separate concepts. If the temple looks for something and the quality is gold, let's go for the gold because it deserves gold. Who owns was the gold created to come to the temple? But to have empty, unuseful items, just to be around with no usage, no decoration, no usage, just because, you know, it feels like, why not? I have so much money, let me waste. Let me throw in the garbage. People can go sometimes to restaurants. I saw it in my own eyes, by the way. They order an order. And I say, you're going to eat all that? 
part of our eating enjoyment is to also throw out. To throw out, to have some of the food go to the garbage. That's the, that gives them the, <laughs> that gives them the pleasure of eating to see that, you know, things are coming, things are flying in the garbage, the Yerba Hashem. The Rebbe says something interesting about the wagons. He said, six wagons was wagons which were meant to serve a purpose. And the purpose was to carry the beams and carry the curtains. If the calculation was that those things fit in six wagons, and to bring one extra wagon and create some empty space for the beams and have like a empty wagon traveling through is a very negative lesson that we are wasting. You need oxen to pull the wagon. Do they have more oxen than you knew what to do with? No, you saw. The, I guess it was two oxen for a wagon. I understand, wagon. but if you overload an oxen, it's not going to last for the entire journeys that they have to make. You need to provide more. So if you maybe need, the calculation is: look, I'm not in the area of engineering a a, a, a trans, transporting wagon. I don't know the numbers. I don't know the math, but I can imagine that there was taking in consideration the two oxen. So one wagon will work. Once you got wheels. <laughs> well, yeah, but you don't drag a, a boat with a, a, a Toyota Corolla and get a big truck to, to, to take well, this. Yeah, one. One. <laughs> <laughs> take a look. The old world is into recycling. Sometimes I laugh how much people have to be convinced to recycle. And again, don't look at me as one of the major green party recyclers. <laughs> but sometimes I laugh how much effort is being put in to convince people to recycle when I'm not so old yet, not so young either, but I'm not so old. But my grandmother to reuse a plastic cup over and over again was a normal way of life. Mm -hmm. Not because she was the green party and not because she was trained to recycle things. It was normal. We don't waste. We don't throw. We don't. <laughs> we, everything is being, you know. There was silver foil left from the Passover counter that's going to become a frame of a picture of something. I don't know. Figure out. They had such creative minds to use and reuse, but to throw. It took a throw. Real garbage was thrown out, but. I don't think my grandmother would have gone for all these paper cups and plastic cups. You know, a tea is a tea with a glass cup and a little plate under that <laughs> big sir coming in, you know, pushing some water. The next thing, the cup is flying. She everything goes to the cup. Comes after a party. You grab from this side of the table, cup, you grab from this side, tie it up. In what's plenty? Oh, there was nice spoons were just not used, and there was challah that was not used, and there was it's called red. Huh? It's called red. Right? But today it's called recycling. It became like a uh, like a way of life. <laughs> and you know, take the Rebbe. The Rebbe is a real good example of that. The Rebbe, in one end, was very, very, very large. Printing books in the massive, giving out dollars, being buildings. The whole approach was no limits. Thinking, thinking at Tanya in every city. It's almost like you look at it like he's like the most, you know, lax about consideration. Go for it, go for it, go. You know, build it and you're going to feel it, whatever the approach. In the other end, the devil was so, so. Calculated, you know that he almost never changed the shoes. He had the same pair of shoes, tens of years, and it was ripped. Fixed it. He did not let himself buy new. 
He did not. I remember one of the brother Rebbe Anu Karl, 1986, in March. Kalwa, the Rebbe comes out and he sees and he asks driver Rebbe Krinsky, who is the car? He says that somebody gave money special to the Rebbe Anu Karl. The Rebbe says, the new car? They joined with my car. They put me in good places. I want that car. Who is that car? They show him it's right, it's still in the, some parking lot. The Rebbe says, but please put this new car in the parking lot and give me back that car. And a few weeks later, he gave a whole talk. I remember that the Moshe Abbas was shot at the yard, 1986. The Rebbe spoke like, what do you guys make in a shoot and a new car? The car is working. So he, and he said he was laughing to say that the chair is getting rubbed off. The chair rubs off. I feel comfortable in the chair. What are you bringing me stuff? It's not necessary. And you look. Then when the Rebbe used to respond to people on papers, they ask questions. He, did, he didn't use a, a paper pad. He didn't use, he used the same paper where the question came and he wrote on it and around it. So it was literally the secretary said to figure out because he's not going to waste the paper. Sometimes they respond went on the envelope and down for the envelope. Meaning this concept, what the Torah is teaching us over here, yes, for quality, but no for waste, is the lesson of the half of wagons. If you can fit it in six wagons, we're not having extra wagon space, walking around just to show that we have enough. If it's empty, then it's waste. And it does not serve a purpose. And the same thing, obviously, a person who is centered around the Mishkan thinks about life. Life to be with its fullest. Meaning, forget about if I'm using it for everything in the best way possible, but to waste time. Waste just to leave it empty, just let it go by. Waste is clearly not kosher. And so, what about the goes of the Kohen and the sacrifices? Clothes didn't wear off for the people when they're they used for the menorah, right? The pieces of the goat only depends, only the depends of the young time. And it's, and it's also there was a, there was a purpose, for there was a purpose for a Kabbalistic purpose. Somehow the pens were needed to be rectified. The Kabbalah talks about the special tikkun for the pens, for the pens represent, and that's why they had to be used for the menorah. But otherwise, no. You know that the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, every year after Yom Kippur services, he had to take this white garment to use for the priesthood and put it in the Gnizah. Meaning, put it where you put the sacred. On paper. He wasn't sports too, he wasn't allowed to use the same garment the following year. So obviously you can say in commentary that everyone spoke a new coin of the year to put the person in the garment. But it's not just that. It is also, you know, we are not worried about buying new garments. It's a, it's, it's a temple. But on the other hand, we are worried about waste. And that's the, the thin line that you have to walk between wasting and spending on quality. There was a guy in our community for many years, his name was Yochanan. He was a Kohen. And he, he told me that my father used to buy very expensive shirts. And he said, I'm not so rich to buy cheap shirts. I, can, I need to change them every day. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so rich to buy a cheap shirt. I don't need, I don't have. So I'm going to buy one good shirt that's going to keep me for a while. So quality, yes. And wasting now. That's the lesson of the wagons. Wishing you all a nice good night. I still have to have Mincha, so I'll see you with the Hashem next opportunity. All the best to you. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Rabbi. You're very welcome. All the best to you. Thank you.
Thank you.